like we said, Dan, it's a bit of an alternative scene. So if you can just paint that picture for us and put it in that, that Herbisher like context. Well, I suppose it's a bit hard to know what was going on in other places, uh, apart, aside from going up to London, as we did quite often. Um, I suppose uh, it was all a bit um, inward looking to the town. Um, and I suppose the popularity of it perhaps indicates that there was very little going on anywhere else. Um, looking back, of course, we had um, a most a wonderful record shop, Heinz, in Broad Street, and that was uh, fantastic because I suppose it well, must have been the time when LPs first came in. Um, so that we we did move, I suppose, at the time that the club was on, we might have moved from um, seventy eights, <laughs> laborious seventy eights, to. Um, there being this wonderful thing in LP and we all used to go off to Heinz and I remember one of the first records that Ed and I bought was um, Johnny Dodds playing um, Piggly Wiggly and Forty and Tight and uh, just it's amazing how you remember the your first record isn't it so Heinz was wonderful it sold pianos and then branched into um, all sorts of uh, records and equipment to play them on and so on but as for what was going in, on in other places in terms of music, I think the answer is probably not a lot. Um, and uh, it's amazing that people who were in that band, um, some of them are, are still playing. <laughs> Lenny Thwaites, I understand, still plays the double bass. In fact, I saw him last about five years ago. He lives in Ledbury and still plays as far as I understand. So his brother died, was the drummer and he died uh, probably about eight years ago, nine years ago. Um, and uh, Ed died in 1997 and Jeff Nuttall died. Um, interestingly, after playing a Sunday morning gig at the Hen and Chickens uh, in Abergavenny. <laughs> yes. But you described your Ed as an anarchist and you had green and blue hair. That sounds like quite, quite daring stuff in the late 50s. Now this was, you know, you know, still rushing book, quite a grey landscape. You're here in rural Herefordshire. Yes, I guess, um, well, I suppose one got a bit of notoriety, really, <laughs> because of um, what well, I actually worked, uh, had a rather sedate job in a, for a, working for a land agent. So I suppose um, I tried to keep fairly quiet the business of the jazz club because, they, again, they were sort of people who were... Um, you know, land agents and surveyors and uh, people well known in the town. And so I used to keep it fairly quiet. Um, but we, uh, when Ed's parents went away, we used to have parties at Kingsthorne House and the band would go up there and play. And uh, yeah, that was, um, we used to have to sort of uh, keep that quiet as well as far as we could. <laughs> but when they went away in the, uh, in the summer, various country pursuits then that was the time to uh, use the house which was great jazz parties oh jazz parties definitely yes yes come on jan we need a bit more description <laughs> than that come on jan go for it <laughs> oh well you know some of these people are probably still around so it might be a bit although of course my parents-in-law are not but uh, yeah we had uh, i remember one occasion when um I suppose the problem was lots of people would come and you didn't know them so much uh, these days of something's broadcast on Facebook and you have to be very careful. And uh, we had in the end to be very careful because people would just uh, come crashing in and there'd be so many people you couldn't keep tabs on everything. And this is absolutely true story. Um, I happened to be uh, in the hall of the house um, at some point and noticed that there was a pile of silver cutlery on the floor piled up forks and spoons against um, <clears throat> the sideboard on which the food was laid. And a person had um, put this stuff there ready to cart away. Fortunately, it was discovered that he was doing that. So mm. nipped that in the bud. <laughs> My father-in-law is Sir Terence Faulkner, and it's an inherited baronetcy from 1777. It's an Irish baronetcy. And um, 
but there's uh, no money with it, unfortunately. <laughs> so um, that's why Ed had to uh, earn a living. And um, in the end, he, uh, after lots of uh, jobs that never lasted very long, he, I suppose, because of his um, anarchical tendencies, possibly, didn't suffer fools gladly, shall we put it that way. And in the end, but he trained in the end as a probation officer when he was 29 and had a career in that. So that was different. And we followed Jeff Nuttall to London, in fact, because Jeff moved the family up to uh, Barnet. And um, we uh, followed on about six weeks after he had left. We upped sticks and uh, I got a, a job and Ed got a job and took it from there. So then the blowing took place in London instead of Hereford. Just going backtracking a little bit, Jan, um, it, the local music scene in the or youth scene in the 1950s, where did young people go? You created this club, but what was there before? Well, there was, uh, as we've said, only the, uh, there was the Park Hall um, Sorry, I'm dance, sorry for sorry. interrupting you, but it'd be really, because Rick's cutting me out, if you could say in the late oh, sorry. 50s, yeah, yeah. so yeah. could my question, sorry, yeah. yeah, thank you, no, yeah. my fault. <laughs> uh, well, in the late 50s, I guess, um, there would have been dances perhaps at the college where I had be, been uh, training for a couple of years, um, that's one thing, but other than your local village halls and the hops that there were there, um, we'd have uh, the... Park Hall Wormelo Dance Hall, which was extremely popular, um, but a little way out. So, of course, that was a bit of a problem unless you could catch a lift with somebody. Uh, or you, I, I had a boyfriend at the time um, years uh, years before, when, before I met Ed, uh, who had a motorbike, so got there on a motorbike. But uh, aside from that, it was difficult to get there. But there was also um, a sort of little ballroom at Red Hill, but that had a, an unfortunate reputation there. So <laughs> you, <laughs> you uh, had to make up your mind whether you'd be seen there or not. Should we put it that way? <laughs> so that was always um, a bit problematic. I think it was partially because um, people would say, oh, there, was, there are squaddies up there. That would be the phrase. And so you were not supposed to uh, be seen there. So. <laughs> But, I mean, aside from sort of dance music uh, for dances, oh, and in addition, of course, um, in Herefordshire, there would be the, what you might call country house hotels. They would have uh, dances as well, which um, one might go to if you were in that sort of a bracket, in those, uh, that strata of society. But, again, it didn't suit everyone to go there. So going back to your club, can you describe it so on a typical night where it was where it yeah. was did it have a name was there dancing was there a bar um that sort of thing just just, just and what do people wear ah yes well in terms of where it was it was at the end of white near the end of wide marsh street the, the um racehorse pub and on the side of it there was uh, the skittle alley which was slightly separate although it was connected it was slightly separate from the pub and so you had to clear away the skittle alley stuff that was packed to the side and uh, then I'd set up my table and uh, the cash box and stuff and people would start pouring in um, and uh, it was very hot very smoky very long and narrow obviously as a as um, Skittle Alley, and uh, you got your drinks from the pub. You went next door to the pub and came back in with your, your beer. Um, and in terms of what people wore, well, I suppose we were still rather affected by rationing and the end of the war and all that stuff. Although it had been years before, you know, that still went on in the 50s, still affected by it all. And um, I suppose we weren't frightfully smart in general, um, but because uh, clothing was not that um, upmarket, not not such a thing as it is today, I suppose. Um, and that dancing, yes, there was lots and lots of dancing. It was uh, if you could uh, move just about on the floor. <laughs> and we had sitters in as well because it was a venue. Then we'd get other musicians who would come 
and it was great if we had someone perhaps who'd come from London. That was very exciting. Um, and uh, that would be a really boosted night if you had a, a good visitor coming. So, yeah. Was it the hip place to be? Oh, it certainly was the hip place to be, for sure. It was, uh, as I said, indicated there was really not much else on. Certainly not music like that. There was nothing like a folk club. I mean, aside from going to a dance hall and having um, Victor Sylvester type stuff, there was nothing uh, like what we had. So, yeah, very exciting it was. Do you remember any of the punters or the customers? Um, only really, I suppose, uh, people who were particular friends. I mean, I must say, because it was so um, popular, uh, because I was on the door, you are uh, very engaged in that. And I, looking back on it, actually, I never had anyone to help me. I just did it. And uh, I think it was a half a crown or something to go in, probably. <laughs> I can't quite remember now. Um, yes, half a crown sounds right. And um, so you'd be, I'd be doing it and giving change and people would be chatting and so on, uh, but trying to shovel their way in because I can tell you it was absolutely sardine tin time because it was all so packed. Um, and uh, particular friends of ours were, uh, were um, Mick and Rosemary Charity. We went round as a foursome and um, Mick worked for Derek Evans. He started off as his apprentice and uh, that's how we got to know Derek Evans through, through Mick really. And uh, so we had lots of fun together. We used to go up to London to clubs and uh, seeing the sights and so on. And we often used to go up for a weekend and have a little... Um, Morris 8, which had followed an Austin 7, chugging along away, away along the Cotswolds. <laughs> Am I right in thinking Derek took your photographs once? Yes, he took some photographs of me when I was 17. Um, in, uh, I remember it was, um, although of course the photos were black and white, I was in a very tasteful um, cotton swimsuit. I think that was about the only fabric you could have aside from wool in those days. And uh, I remember it had a cuffed top and uh, it was green with flowers or something on it and yes he took pictures of me um, and uh, others other pictures aside from the swimsuit um, I remember various hats and so on and uh, yes yeah, so I think those photographs are somewhere around I've got a few but um, not a, not a great many but I think there are there are others and I know the singer in the band Jean there are various photographs that I think she has and um, but go, go, going the round suddenly popular <laughs> yeah Derek Evans uh, did come to the club occasionally uh, because he and Mick got on very well together and uh, there are probably some photographs in his archive I'm not sure about that but uh, as there are so many million photographs in it, it's very difficult to sort them out. But I gather the singer Jean, um, she may have had uh, photographs taken of her by Derek Evans. And um, I think there are pictures around w within her family of uh, contemporaneous to the time when we were there, <laughs> jiving and all that. Yes, jiving, of course, that was also the thing, yeah. Big thing, great. Unfortunately, uh, because uh, Ed had had polio, there was never any chance of jiving with him. But you certainly wouldn't be able to do it much in the club because uh, nothing very um, uh, <laughs> expressive anyway, because it was just so packed, you know, shoulder to shoulder, really. I wonder, do you know of any budding romances that have lasted the day that started at the club? Um... I think that Mick and Rose may have met uh, at the club actually um, very right early on and um, then subsequently we I suppose we gelled as a foursome very quickly so that was all that was brilliant and uh, we were each other's uh, bridesmaids that's the women not the men um, and uh, yeah so yeah we were both married in Hereford this year so both of us not the same time. <laughs> and one of the first ones I wanted to ask was, 
actually where um, Ed Stanley's house was. I wasn't sure if you said where it actually was. Uh, yes, it's at Kingsthorne. It's about five miles outside Hereford, going towards Ross. Right. Uh, there's a, a what's called a top road, um, and uh, sort of much birches, I suppose. Um, and uh, it's on the it, that the house is on the top that top road with a beautiful view over the Welsh mountains. Very nice. I'm, I'm imagining it was um, well known as people used to go and have parties there. Yes, it was indeed, indeed, yes. Um, also, um, I wasn't sure if you w said what the name of Ed's band was. And also, I was going to ask if they actually played in some other towns around here o as well as Hereford. So, what was the name of the band? Yes, well, it did have different names, and of course, when we went to London, it had the name of the band had to change. It was called Ed Faulkner's Easy Riders, and uh, that's when it, we started off because Jeff Nussel figured that using Ed's name would be more of a draw than using his name because Ed was quite well known in Hereford. Um, also, because of the fact that you set up the club at um, at the racehorse, uh, the jazz club, and you mentioned about the record shop as well, I wondered if you had sort of connections with people like the man who ran the record shop and people who maybe were doing things in other places. If you sort of collaborated with them, or I just imagined it might have been a bit of a social thing between... Well, I think that, um, in terms of the record shop and, and buying of records and so on, and there would be that collaboration because the guy who um, started uh, in probably importing from America to start with a lot of... Uh, when, when LPs had come in, um, there would have been collaboration in the sense that he knew that uh, we ran the club and it was in his interest to stock jazz records. But at the beginning, when LPs first came in, um, there was y you really had to order what you wanted from a catalogue. You wouldn't have vast displays of records and just go and pick something. I mean, that came on quite quickly, of course, um, as the market developed. But at the beginning, you had to order, order your stuff and eagerly wait for it to arrive. You were saying that you went to London and lived in London for a while before you came back to Hereford. Yes. So I'm assuming that you found this sort of scene in London with all the jazz and things that were happening there, and that's why you brought it back here. You know, you, you started the ball rolling. I think that's, that's yes, true. well, I suppose one, um, in a sense, outlived... Um, what was an offer in Herefordshire for young people and, and musically. So that was one another reason really to go to London. And Jeff Nuttall was playing his cornet uh, all around the North London jazz circuit as that developed uh, in the late 50s into the 1960s. And so we followed Jeff um, leaving the club behind um, because the, uh, clearly the, the one had very quickly, I suppose, outstripped the possibilities of music in Herefordshire. And we went to London, and uh, but came back regularly because I think we, Ed was very keen that one tried to make sure that the jazz club did keep functioning. And so we'd come back at least once a month and uh, endeavour to uh, have a gig somewhere wasn't necessarily always at the club, but uh, it might be with that band, but trying to play in pubs elsewhere in Herefordshire to spread it around a little bit. And uh, I don't think there was even jazz and uh, the dance halls. I fear, that in a sense, well, I fear is not, <laughs> not a good word, is it? That it was the uh, sort of slightly larger orchestras that played for um, the sort of, uh, you know, uh, ballroom dancing. And... Um, there was not much in the way of jazz f for a bit anyway there in those dance halls. But you're saying then you went to London after you set the club up. But oh, yes. You had been in London before you set the club up. No, we hadn't. No, oh, no. Because had. we were 17. When, no, I, we lived, uh, I lived in Hereford. I had a flat in Hereford. And uh, Ed lived at Kingsthorne House. And uh, we were 17 when we set the club up. 
and we did it for two years and then we're 19 when we went to London. Yeah, and then came back two years later, got married, uh, to, get, to get married here, that was all. We didn't come back to live. Um, and I didn't come back to live here till 2001. So that was uh, yeah, a long time in London. So, so you planted the seed. <laughs> I hope we did, yes, yes, because it is amazing when you talk to people. Uh, not that one's talking about it all the time, but um, if the, the club comes up, there are people who really do remember it and how influential it was. Another thing I wanted to ask you was about Derek Evans, um, who is a friend of um, you said Mick. I think it's Charity. Yes, Mick, Mick Charity. Uh, were, uh, yes, thank you for asking about that. Derek Evans had, um, as it were, an apprentice. I suppose he was at the time of Mick Charity, who, uh, in his own right, became an internationally renowned photographer. And he was linked with the band, or. Um, well, no, Mick just used to, he was, uh, because we went round as a foursome, Mick and his then girlfriend, Rosemary, and Ed and I, that was why <coughs> they always came to the club every week, um, for support, really, and friendship. I have, um, I've seen a lot of photographs that Derek Evans took of jazz clubs mm. and um, jazz on TV, I think it was in Bristol, and places like that, presumably in the 60s. I just wondered if you'd ever gone to any of those. Um, oh, yes. Uh, thank you for mentioning Bristol. We did. I think the scene, the jazz scene in Bristol developed quite quickly and with great enthusiasm. And in the end, um, so way on into the 70s and 80s, almost every pub in Bristol was absolutely a rocking place. Uh, and Cardiff as well. And uh, from London, Ed and I, from early days of having left Hereford, we used to go to Cardiff um, for gigs because you could get there quite quickly from London. And uh, and then if we came to stay back in Herefordshire, we might then go to Cardiff from here because it you know, only takes an hour or so. Um, and again, Ed played a lot with Jeff over the years, um, having, as you say, sowed the seed at the club, at uh, the racehorse. Um, it did develop from there and Ed played uh, was still playing right until his death in 1997. Well, it's extraordinary, but perhaps it's perhaps it reflects on the fact that people tend to come back to uh, where they spent their youth. Um, but just recently, I, in an extraordinary way, um, have uh, almost not quite met her yet, but I'm, I'm about to I met the singer from the band, Jean. Um, uh, who's now called Jean Wright, and she lives in Hereford. And uh, so that was talked about with a group of people that um, I wouldn't have thought would have had any connection with jazz and didn't have any connection with Hereford. And suddenly this connection popped up, and I met her granddaughter, and uh, who had, here's my, here's my grandma, photographs on the phone, and th there's Jean. And uh, so we're hoping to meet up anyway before too long. Um, but also, uh, for a, a different uh, job that I do um, in, a, in the educational world at the moment, um, I suddenly, well, I don't know, suddenly, you have a conversation and how does something about the, like a jazz club in Hereford come up, but it did. And um, the head teacher at one particular school said, oh, yes, well, my uncle was manager of the racehorse uh, pub at the time that the club started. And so she said, yes, yes, I'll talk to my uncle. So again, that's very recent. So I'm hoping to um, get on to that as well. So there'll be more information there. And he might have photographs, of course. So that was uh, extraordinary. And um, as I say, Jeff Nuttall came back also and played in Abergavenny every week. And uh, he settled in uh, near Brecon. And... Um, so the influence was there, and he was still playing until the day he died, actually, and uh, having just played at the pub in Abergavenny. So that was a, an unfortunate day, but, you know, the way he would have wanted to go.